Okay, we will get going. So hello everybody, thank you all for joining us for this webinar, which is part of our series of presentations being delivered on applying evidence in practice as part of the Comorbidity Project, which is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health. My name is Christina Morell. I am a Senior Research Fellow and Program Lead of Treatment and Translation of Complex Populations at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. And along with Erin Madden, who is a project officer on the Comorbidity Project, and Professor Catherine Mills, who is Director of Early Intervention and Treatment Research at the Matilda Centre, I have the very great pleasure of facilitating this webinar, which is being presented by Logan Harvey. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to, to the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting, and of course recognise that we are across Australia today. The traditional, the traditional owners of the lands that I'm currently on are the Gadigal peoples of the Eora Nation, but I'd also like to pay my respects to other traditional owners of the lands across Australia for everybody else who is here. I'd also like to recognise and acknowledge the many people with lived experience of mental illness and substance use, as well as their families and carers, many of whom have very generously contributed to the development of the comorbidity guidelines and our other resources. If you've been to one of our webinars before, you would have heard these few introductory slides already, so please feel free to uh, tune out for a minute or so and come back. But just to quickly go over a few things before we begin, just to let you know whether you're joining us live or watching the recording, you're in listen-only mode, which means that we can't see or hear you. So don't worry about muting yourselves or turning off your cameras, just uh, make sure that you can see and hear us. And secondly, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A and chat buttons on your screen. So please feel free to click on the Q&A button and type in any questions that you have for Logan um, at any time during the presentation today. Uh, if you have any comments or anything other than questions for Logan, please use the chat. This just helps Erin and me identify any questions that you have and pull them out um, for Logan and separate those from the general comments. If you have any technical issues during the webinar today, you can contact Zoom support or you can access the recording of the webinar as well as PDF handouts of the slides from today which will both be available to download from the website on your screen there. And we'll also be sending a follow-up email to everybody who's here with a link to access those. If you find Zoom chat distracting, you can have a play around with the settings on your end to disable what messages you see. And to do this, you just need to go to the Zoom desktop app if you have it installed, click on the settings wheel in the top right-hand corner of the screen, and then select chat on the navigation menu. And you should then be able to change what messages you see by changing the push notifications or even your do not disturb times. But it can take a little bit of fiddling around to get the settings right. So I've put the Zoom link there um, in case you want to follow up on that later. And I think Erin's going to post that in the chat as well. So today's webinar is focused on targeting comorbidity in AOD treatment with EMDR therapy. And before I hand over to Logan to get us started, I just want to quickly mention the link to access our webinar library where you can find all our past webinars and that's on screen. And thank you again to everybody who's been coming along to this series, either live or watching the recordings later and sending through feedback and suggestions for webinars. In fact, today's topic was organized in response to some of your feedback. So thank you again for coming along and also engaging with us. And now it's my very great pleasure to stop talking and introduce our presenter for today, Logan Harvey. Logan is an experienced clinical psychologist who's primarily worked in specialist substance use treatment services for clients with co-occurring mental health and substance use conditions. Logan is currently a PhD candidate at the Matilda Center, where his research focuses on the relationship between complex post-traumatic stress disorder and substance use. I'm so glad that Logan could be here today and share his wealth of knowledge and expertise. Um, so I will hand over to him to get us started. Thank you so much, Logan. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thanks for coming along, everyone, today. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about EMDR um, and giving a bit of a general um, introduction to EMDR and how it can be used in a substance use um, treatment setting. So obviously, after today, um, you'll have a bit of an idea of how EMDR kind of works, what it looks like, and a bit of information about the evidence base. And I'll also give you um, some information about the training if anyone's interested in that. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm presenting, and for me that's the Gubby Gubby people. I'd also like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Just a quick note that um, I will make mention today of some experiences of a traumatic nature. So if everyone can just be mindful of their own safety um, and how they're tracking today and, and take whatever steps you need to to support yourself. 
So as I mentioned, we're going to talk a bit about EMDR today, and we're going to focus on um, understanding the key components of EMDR therapy, what it actually looks like, understanding the theory and the evidence base behind it, and then um, some ideas about how we might use it in an AOD setting, particularly in the area of comorbidity. So EMDR um, was created in the late 80s by a researcher named Francine Shapiro. And there's a, an interesting story to its development. Um, and essentially, one day Francine um, explained she was walking along um, and thinking of some distressing experiences she'd had recently. And she noticed that as she was walking, she kind of spontaneously had this experience of the distress dissipating. Um, and when she recalled those experiences again, brought them back into her mind, they didn't seem as distressing. So she was curious about this and she kind of was thinking about it as she walked along and she noticed that her eyes were moving um, rapidly back and forth side to side while she was thinking of this memory. And so then she tried to kind of replicate that process um, and noticed it seemed to help reduce the distress she was experiencing. So for most of us, that would be a strange thing to happen on a walk and we'd leave it there. But um, Francine instead went on um, to launch a PhD investigating this. And she then created a whole school of therapy called EMDR therapy based on that simple experience she had. Now, Francine initially um, theorized that EMDR worked by desensitizing a memory, taking the emotional charge out of it. But as she kind of studied and researched the therapy, she eventually realized that it wasn't just a desensitization effect that was happening. There was also a sense of reprocessing of information in that people have a different understanding um, of the meaning behind an event after EMDR. So after a, a sort of an iterative process of her developing and um, building on the therapy, we've been left with eye movement desensitizing, which is um, a mouthful that we're all stuck with now forever. Now, Francine did um, spend a lot of time trying to understand the, the phenomena she discovered, and she developed what's called the adaptive information processing model um, to try and explain what she was seeing in her, in her research. Now, this model very simply um, suggests that all of our brains have an innate natural capacity to process stressful events. And this is very much based in research. We know that um, the majority of people will experience some sort of traumatic event in their lifetime, but a very small percentage of those people will develop PTSD. So for most of us, our brain does manage to work through a traumatic experience. For some people, um, and in the case of some events, though, there seems to be some disruption in how this processing occurs. And a result of that is that these memories are maladaptively stored um, and they can be sort of overly influential on thoughts and feelings and behavior later and generate symptoms. So the AIP model simply states that um, as a result of this maladaptive storage, if we can activate our brain's innate information processing system, um, then we can resolve some of the difficulties attached to this. Now, obviously, um, there's a, a lot of complicated research in the background of EMDR, and it still is a bit of a mystery. We have a, a number of mechanisms of action that we think kind of help us understand what Shapiro has discovered. And I'm not going to talk in detail about them, but some of the key studies are listed here on this slide if anyone wants to look into them further. What we do kind of know is that EMDR does seem to do things slightly differently to other therapies. There's a lot of overlap with other therapies, but it doesn't appear to just be a function um, of exposure to a traumatic memory, like we see in CBT-based therapies like prolonged exposure. So there seems to be something slightly different that happens in EMDR. Um, there are a lot of theories as to what's happening in the brain when we're performing EMDR, but at this stage, we know that it's not simply exposure to a memory um, and that there's some extra things that might be going on. This is often a, a bit of a hang-up around EMDR in the literature, and people get quite... Um, upset about this, um, particularly people who aren't experienced with EMDR, because they want to know how it works and why it works. And, and there's a lot of skepticism about it. But I think if we look more broadly in the literature, it's actually not unusual for a psychotherapy to not have detailed um, mechanism research behind it. And we don't tend to do lots of um, 
deconstruction studies with different therapies and look in minute detail at every bit. Um, EMDR has some of those studies, but I think it's still a little hang up in the literature that's a bit of a holdover from the early days. When we're talking about EMDR therapy, um, you'll notice that I'm saying EMDR therapy. And, and part of the reason for that is that I think EMDR is often just considered a technique. And for most people, they have an idea of EMDR being a, um, a brief intervention that we might use as part of other therapies. EMDR is a, a whole process of therapy, though, um, as a standalone intervention. Now, um, <clears throat> there's eight phases of EMDR. And the, the phase that most people are familiar with, with the eye movements, is phase four, desensitization. So that's the bit most people are expecting to see. But like any other psychotherapy, um, phases one and two are all about history taking and treatment planning, understanding what's going on for the client, what their presenting issue is, and, and what maybe is going on contextually around that. And also then helping the client kind of prepare for an intervention and sort of do some initial stabilization through skills and um, strategy development and things. Now, our first um, two phases may take one or two sessions. Um, there's no trauma processing that occurs in there um, officially. It may take a longer period of time, though, and there's a bit of um, debate in the literature about how much preparation is required, but we've got pretty good research now that for most people, we don't need a, a lengthy preparation phase. But all implementations of the MDR should have a, a detailed history taking and treatment planning process at the start where we get a really thorough conceptualization of what's happening for the client. And then some level of preparing the client to understand what the intervention might involve um, and what skills and strategies they might need along the way if they're experiencing um, any kind of exacerbation in symptoms or any change in what's going on for them. Once that's done, um, we move into phases three to seven, and this is what we kind of think of as the actual trauma processing part. In short, what this involves is identifying a target memory that we're going to work on, activating that, having the client think of that in, in a certain way to um, make it vivid and detailed in their mind in a session. Then we apply the eye movements through the desensitization phase. And once the memory is desensitized, that is the emotional charge is out of it after repeated sets of eye movements, we'll then work with um, what we call installation, which is helping the client develop a more adaptive understanding of the event. We'll finish off with a body scan exercise normally, which is a way for us to kind of check in with the client to see whether there's any lingering distress. And then a closure, which is where we debrief with the client and kind of give them some advice and, and prepare them for the next little while after a difficult session. Our final phase is reevaluation. And this is how we start most EMDR sessions. Essentially, all we're doing here is checking in on a memory we worked on in a previous session to see how it's sitting now. Does it feel like it's desensitized? Have there been any changes in how the person thinks of that memory? And then more broadly, when they review their progress across treatment, um, are they noticing anything that's come up for them? Any changes or any differences in their, in their symptoms in general or in their life? Now, as I mentioned, we talk a lot in EMDR about targeting a memory. Um, and when we're talking about that, there's sort of three components of a memory that we would work with. We first ask the client to identify a visual image, a representation in their mind's eye of the worst part of a memory. So when we're working with a trauma memory, we want a, a client to be able to bring up a, a visual picture, a snapshot, a freeze frame that really for them represents, yeah, this picture here, this image shows how bad it was. Now, while they're bringing that image up, we want to get an understanding of what kind of ideas are attached to that. And in the MDR, we look for two types of ideas. We look for a negative belief about themselves that most represents that memory. And then we also look for a positive belief that they'd rather hold about themselves. Finally, we get them to identify what kind of emotion is elicited when they think of that memory. What are they feeling in the session as they think of that? And what kind of body sensation goes with that? How does that emotion resonate physically for them in their body? So a brief example um, for a client who's been assaulted, the, the image that comes to mind might be the moment that they were about to be um, hurt. And they might say something like, I see his face, he's angry and yelling at me. When they think of that image, the belief about themselves that sits most strongly is something like I'm weak. 
And then a positive belief they'd rather hold about themselves is I'm a survivor, which is a nice counter belief, I think, to I'm weak. A client might say something like, I feel fear and it's sitting across my chest. That's kind of the level of detail we would need in EMDR to target a memory. And, and this is one of the nice things about EMDR as well is clients don't actually have to tell me the whole story of what happened to them. Um, we can effectively implement the treatment um, with very little detail of what happened. And sometimes that's really um, sort of reassuring for the client that they don't have to go through and tell me the whole story. I need a snapshot of the, of the memory that tells me that this client has activated the memory. It's in their mind, it's fresh, and, and they're thinking about it, but I don't need to know the full narrative of what happened. So as we go through EMDR, we target typically multiple memories in that way um, and, and implement the intervention. What we also do in EMDR though, is not just focus on the past events related to the presenting issues, but we also target present um, or recent events and future events. So for instance, if a client presents um, with PTSD following a car accident, then yes, yeah, certainly we'll apply EMDR on the memory of the car accident, but we'll also potentially target recent experiences where their symptoms have occurred. So for instance, they may have had a difficult um, re-experiencing moment when driving their car recently or when hearing the screech of tires. And we'll also then look at things that might be coming up in the future that could prove difficult, things that they're anticipating are going to be hard or um, things that they're avoiding or don't want to approach. So, for instance, um, having to return to work um, and start driving for work again, a client may struggle with that. And so we may form an, um, a, an imagined image of what that might look like in future and target it in the same way that we would with a past event. So I know that's a very brief snapshot of um, kind of what EMDR might look like. And I'm conscious as well that there's there are lots of examples of, um, of mock sessions and things available online that people can look at to get a sense of what it might actually appear um, like in a real session. But I guess the big standout of EMDR and the bit that everyone's always interested in is the eye movements. It's, it's the thing that sets EMDR apart. So EMDR therapy does involve um, the application of what we call bilateral stimulation. All that means is some sort of um, sensory stimulation that's side to side on alternating on a person's body. So as I mentioned, um, Francine Shapiro's initial investigations in this area looked at eye movements, moving your eyes back and forth. And so for most people in a session of EMDR, they'll follow a therapist's hand back and forth so that while they're thinking of the memory, they also have to track a, a therapist's hand and pay attention to that. We do, however, implement other forms of bilateral stimulation. Um, this can include things like tapping side to side um, on their body, tapping their knees or tapping their shoulders side to side, having a therapist tap their knees side to side. Um, we can use things like auditory stimulation, so wearing headphones that play tones side to side that alternate. Um, or holding what we often call buzzers, um, which are just small little devices. You hold one in each hand and it buzzes um, and vibrates in an alternating pattern, similar to a feeling that your phone would have when um, it vibrates. So there's lots of um, technology and devices that have been created for EMDR. We do have the most evidence for the eye movements, though. Um, they've been studied the most. And in the studies that have compared eye movements to other talk, um, types of stimulation, the eye movements tend to do a bit better. So we try to prioritize those. Importantly, though, some clients can't do that. Some clients with um, eye problems, um, whether that's injuries or just difficulties with vision, um, that can be a problem. So it's nice to know we have some backups there. The eye movements are the, the most controversial part of the therapy, but we've got some research um, that does show that they add something. So above and beyond what else is happening in the therapy, we know that the eye movements seem to do something um, unique, that they have a unique contribution to the therapy. We've seen some um, experimental and laboratory research that's kind of looked into this in a lot of detail. And we know that even in a laboratory setting, if we get people to think of an aversive memory or a difficult memory and then perform some sort of visual tracking task, whether it's um, similar to EMDR or something else, there's some studies looking at things like um, people playing Tetris. We know that performing that sort of task while thinking of the memory will tend to reduce the vividness of the memory, how um, detailed and clear and intense it appears in their mind's eye. 
but also the emotional intensity. So what they actually feel when they bring up that memory. We have some theories about um, how it may happen, as I mentioned earlier. So the, the one that seems to be attracting the most research evidence nowadays is um, the working memory theory that kind of suggests that by having a client perform an eye movement task while thinking of a traumatic memory, um, it'll tax their working memory. So it, it um, uses up their attentional ability. So they can't be fully immersed in the traumatic memory. And instead, they're kind of um, forced to keep part of their attention focused here and now and part of it focused on the memory in the past. And so in EMDR, we often talk about having one foot in the present and one foot in the past, one foot in the memory, one foot in the room with the therapist. We have some studies that show that performing this kind of eye movement process in therapy, um, as in EMDR, does seem to reduce activation of the limbic system. So it turns down that kind of emotive response that happens when we think of the memory. And so it seems to be that if we can get this right, this balance between um, bilateral stimulation, focusing on the, um, the sensory input in the room and also the, um, the memory itself, that it allows the brain to reprocess the target memory. And, and part of that is desensitizing it so it becomes less distressing. And the other part of it is developing new understandings of it. Um, and I think that's a it's an important part of the MDR that's often overlooked. People think of it as a desensitization therapy only. So we have some really good evidence um, for MDR now. MDR has been endorsed by a, a range of different treatment guidelines around the world. Um, but you'll notice that I've stated here that the evidence for PTSD is very clear. And, and the reason for that is um, that the early research all occurred around PTSD. And certainly most research has occurred um, in using EMDR to treat PTSD. So in that area, we've got really strong confidence that EMDR is effective um, and is as effective in, in a lot of studies as um, our standalone kind of CBT interventions that, that most people would be familiar with. We do also have some nice evidence though starting to emerge in other areas. So this is um, some studies that give an example of the sort of work being done in the area of depression. And in particular, using a trauma um, focused approach to treating something like depression. So that instead of um, focusing on maybe the symptoms of depression, um, like a lot of other therapies would, we would instead kind of focus on the events or the early experiences a person's been through that may underlie their um, symptoms of depression. So we have some nice evidence now that um, this sort of approach is particularly useful for people with um, recurrent episodes of depression that maybe haven't responded to other treatments. Um, and so depression is an area that really kind of shows the utility of, of EMDR outside of PTSD. There are many, many, many protocols and applications of EMDR in the literature. And if you start um, doing some Googling, you'll find that EMDR has been applied to all sorts of things. The vast majority of them don't have a lot of evidence um, and, and part of that is that they're often implemented in very different ways across different studies um, and also the the studies tend to be small and of pretty low quality so we have lots of confidence in the area of PTSD and there's a few other areas um, depression OCD where we have some emerging um, evidence which is looking quite strong um, and a lot of other areas where there's a, some evidence but not a lot of high quality evidence. So that kind of brings us to MDR and substance use treatment and when we're looking at this area the old kind of conundrum of the chicken and the egg comes up. Do we treat the substance use issue or do we treat the factors um, or the symptoms or the issues that are maybe perpetuating or maintaining or underlying the substance use? In the EMDR literature, um, this is kind of conceptualizing two different approaches to treatment in this area. One is addiction focused treatment. And, and I use the word addiction here because that tends to be how this is described in the EMDR literature. The other is trauma focused treatment. Now addiction focused treatment involves using EMDR um, to specifically target components of the, um, the addiction or the, the substance use disorder. So this includes things like targeting cravings um, and urges related to substance use or addiction related memories. So things like memories of the first use of a substance or particularly salient memories of relapse um, or adverse events. Often clients can recall um, particularly emotive or strong 
experiences of using a substance and and often if you have a client recall a memory like that they'll experience a craving in the moment so sometimes in emdr we can actually target those sorts of events and there are protocols that have been developed around that approach the other side um, of the coin is trauma focused treatment and this involves targeting kind of the comorbidity side of things to reduce the addictive behavior um, indirectly so often this is around targeting adverse events traumatic experiences that are related to comorbid symptoms and, and long-term negative self-belief so in this approach we may not actually target any of the specific substance use related issues the addiction focused approaches do have a bit um, an evidence base that's there there's some laboratory kind of experimental studies that show that using emdr tasks can reduce craving um and the intensity of visual imagery around um addiction related memories so these are often performed in related in relation to things like um nicotine and also food related um issues and so typically what they'll do here is have a client um recall a um an experience of using um a substance like smoking a cigarette they'll get them to think of a really detailed intense memory of using that that maybe elicits a craving and then perform some sort of eye movement task and what they tend to see is that the level of craving will reduce um and the visual imagery associated with that might also change there's some nice results there and some interesting ones but one of the tricky things with those studies is that the follow-up or the um the sort of sustained impact of those interventions seems to reduce so we get a good result initially the craving seems to drop right off but it may not last despite that um there's a big pool of studies that have looked at implementing emdr treatments um on a range of substance use and behavioral addictions so most of these studies um find positive results um a lot of them find positive results in the short term more than the long term often the long-term results as I sort of mentioned with the experimental studies um tend to disappear so we see an initial effect and then once we do follow up it doesn't seem to be as present um, but also unfortunately these studies all use wildly different approaches some of these are um, in that kind of addiction focused um, approach others are more the trauma focused approach they will use totally different implementations of EMDR, different numbers of sessions. Some of them are um, using EMDR on top of existing treatment approaches. Others are using EMDR as a standalone. Some are short bursts of treatment, some are longer. And so the downside to this is we kind of have these indications that across a range of sort of behavioral addictions and substance use issues, there seems to be an effect. We just don't know really which bits are effective. Um, and the other downside is that often these studies are small and um, not very methodologically um, robust. So there's often issues in the design of these studies, which means we can't really generalize the results too far. The reviews that have been conducted to date um, on all of this literature tend to show that, yeah, there seems to be something there. Using EMDR on specifically targeting um, addiction seems to have some sort of useful effect we're not so sure how long it lasts but it's really hard to form any conclusions um, one because of the wide variety of implementations of EMDR but also because of the um, the methodological issues and things like risk of bias that's present in the studies there's not enough evidence to make any definitive statements at this point um, and not enough evidence for any kind of meta-analyses or anything like that that could give us a sense of across the board what does this look like what we do kind of know though is that um, EMDR has an evidence base in, in treating PTSD definitely and it's looking pretty good in other areas like depression it does seem to have an impact on craving and the um, intensity of thoughts about substance use we're not sure how um, sustained those impacts will be though and studies generally show a positive effect of EMDR on substance use even though we can't quite narrow down exactly what approaches might be um, most recommended I think though if we look at that literature in the broader substance use literature we can start to see maybe some of the utility of EMDR 
So one of the things that we, we know for sure is that most people seeking substance use treatment um, will have experienced multiple adverse events in their life. They will have ex typically experienced both childhood and adult um, trauma experiences. And these will be both prior to and during their substance use. We also know that the majority are likely to have some form of comorbid mental health symptoms. And we know that particularly trauma related disorders and things like anxiety and depression are particularly prevalent in this population. And we know that the, um, the presence of those adverse experiences, that background um, experience has some relationship to treatment engagement and outcomes. We also know that EMDR has good treatment effects on symptoms related to adverse events like traumatic experiences in different populations and presentations and not just in PTSD. We know it's an efficient treatment, it's pretty quick um, and there's some evidence that it's a little bit quicker than CBT even. Um, it doesn't require a lengthy kind of level of preparation, um, it can be used fairly quickly when implemented well. And it also doesn't involve homework. So in terms of a treatment to be um, applied in low resource settings, it's actually pretty useful. We also know that this sort of trauma focused intervention um, is quite safe and effective in a substance use setting. And we've got lots of research into other trauma focused um, in interventions that have kind of helped us build a big literature base there, even outside of EMDR. So if we kind of take all of that information together, we can kind of get a sense that um, there seems to be some positive utility of EMDR in treating addiction. We're not sure exactly what. We do know it's definitely useful for treating um, symptoms related to adverse or traumatic events. And we know that most of the people that we're going to be treating in this area will have um, those sorts of symptoms and will have experienced those sorts of events. So given that, it seems to be that um, EMDR might be quite a useful intervention to add to our um, toolkit in this area. So I want to give an example then of um, one of the ways we might use something like EMDR in this area. And this is not a, um, an addiction focused example, um, quite specifically, because I think we, we can think too narrowly about EMDR in this space. And we need to really look at what we know EMDR is effective for and, and start there and implementing it. So this is um, a little summary of a client that I'll call John. Um, who was a, a gentleman I saw for methamphetamine use, and he also had comorbid depression. He kind of presented with this repeating cycle of um, abstinence and relapse and depressive symptoms, and he would typically fall into a, um, a depressive episode that would often see him kind of giving up, disengaging from things, dropping out of treatment, um, feeling just really hopeless and useless and like there was no point. It had multiple attempts at treatment. Um, and one of the big themes that came through with John was that he had really significant issues with his self-worth. So based both on his substance use, but also his broader life, at the core of what was going on for him, he really felt that he was quite worthless. Um, and every treatment failure, every relapse, every um, thing that went wrong in his life seemed to confirm that for him. So when John and I sat down and looked at um, his life and some of the things that had been going on for him, we saw that in his childhood, he experienced um, a lot of emotional neglect and abuse. This included things like um, being overlooked um, and disregarded and dismissed, but also um, clear abuse, um, ridicule, criticism, um, verbal abuse, things like that. In his, his adolescence, he was bullied quite severely. Um, and this ranged from both kind of exclusion and um, humiliation right through to physical assaults. He developed a, a substance use issue in his adolescence. And related to his substance use, he had um, one particular very difficult experience of relapse, um, but a lot of others that were difficult. And also one very scary overdose um, experience. In his early adult life, um, he'd experienced a few incidents of interpersonal violence related to his substance use, and also one very significant relationship breakdown. 
He also had a, a range of experiences related to treatment um, that were quite negative. So these were really um, stigma related experiences being um, spoken to very poorly by health workers um, in different areas. And, and this is in primary care, but also in um, hospital settings. Um, and then also treatment setbacks, like we often see, you know, people might um, struggle to engage in treatment or have hiccups along the way. And he had some particularly damaging experiences where um, significant progress he made was quite derailed um, and he felt quite um, dismissed and sort of cast aside in those instances when he was um, excluded from treatment. So when we looked at all of this together, um, John and I sort of noticed very quickly that across his whole life, um, the trajectory of all of his experiences that brought him into treatment were consistent with this underlying theme of him feeling worthless. And when he talked about his substance use, when he talked about his depression, this was the kind of headline of that article. This was the title of the, the movie about his life, basically. So we decided that this seemed to be pretty crucial to both his substance use and his depressive symptoms. And we thought we'd better kind of focus on this a little bit um, to try and better understand this and see if we can reduce the influence of this sense of worthlessness. So what John and I did then um, was we mapped out a series of targets for treatment um, that were kind of key examples in his life um, that had taught him maybe that he is worthless. John had been through hundreds of difficult and adverse experiences, but we didn't identify every single experience. What we looked for were the, the experiences that were most distressing or difficult, the ones that really stuck with him, that he thought about a lot, um, but also the experiences that really characterized this, that really showed, yes, this is what it was like for me. Um, and this is how I, um, how I got to where I am basically. So there was one experience in his childhood um, of his mother telling him that he was a waste of space and kicking him out of home. And that was when he was quite young. He was, I think, seven or eight years old and he was kicked out of home and slept outside for a night while all of his family was inside. Um, there was a particularly violent assault in his adolescent years at high school. Um, it was quite humiliating. He had um, his first major relapse in which he'd lost, his, um, lost a job that he was very proud of and then had a real kind of um, derailment of his life. The loss of a key partner um, in his early, early adulthood. And then one particularly difficult experience um, in an emergency department where he was really interrogated. Um, he was left in pain, um, told he didn't have a mental health problem, dismissed, um, and essentially wasn't provided the treatment he probably deserved. So across those phases of EMDR, this is kind of what it looked like for John and I. We focused initially on really getting a shared understanding of his past and, and how his negative self-worth issues kind of developed. We taught him some basic skills and strategies to manage craving and acute distress. And this probably took up 20 minutes of one session. We, we didn't spend lots of time on this. He was taught how EMDR works and given the rationale for why we might use this intervention. And then once he sort of understood the, the potential for it um, and we'd mapped out some of those experiences, we then picked those key experiences that we we're going to start with. We, did, we designed a little bit of a, um, a treatment list, prioritizing those memories. And then we activated those memories and applied EMDR to them. So John had a series of EMDR processing sessions. Um, some are very quick and easy and some are very difficult. Um, and it was not a um, not the case that it was one session per memory necessarily. Um, some of these memories took more than one session. And along the way, as we processed um, sequentially through those memories, we were kind of checking in and keeping an eye on what John was noticing in his life, what was different for him. Um, and also how he experienced those memories now when he thought of them. So across that treatment, John had multiple relapses. Um, sometimes therapy would be interrupted. He might miss one appointment. Sometimes he'd disappear for a few weeks. So we were quite flexible um, and quite opportunistic with this treatment. 
once we kind of had an established plan and we knew what was going on for John, um, something like a relapse would practically interrupt treatment, but we kind of saw that as pausing treatment more than anything else. Um, so John might come back and, and once he was in a position where he'd um, kind of regathered himself, and that wasn't um, by any stretch a lengthy process. He may have, um, you know, been using up until a few days before a session, but we would talk about it as long as he felt confident. We would get back into EMDR. We would always review the relapses, um, but most of our discussions about that were really looking at, well, does this fit the pattern we've already identified? Is this more of the same or is this something different? And interestingly, we would look at things like what, what might have triggered a particular relapse. And often we would see it was all on theme, um, experiences in his life or things that happened that really reinforced that idea that he's worthless um, or triggered that um, in some way, often led to a relapse. We targeted some recent events that reinforced this, including some of those little relapses um, and difficult events that were going on in his life. And then we also targeted some feared future events. Um, so things like, well, what if I get back on track and I get a job that I really like and then I relapse, what if it all falls apart? How am I going to cope with that? Um, and we were able to process some of those events um, or, or potential events as well. As we kind of worked through this over a period of time, um, John was able to kind of begin to stretch out his periods of abstinence. Um, he, he was still using methamphetamine on occasion, but what we noticed was he was able to hold back from using it more often. Um, and often he could sort of interrupt the process. So instead of falling into a protracted kind of um, relapse where he might disappear for weeks, often it, it would be sort of a lot more what you would call a lapse, you know, these brief sort of setbacks. Um, and sometimes he would come in and he wouldn't have had significant adverse events related to his substance use. Um, and he wouldn't speak kindly of himself about it, but it wasn't having the, um, the real dysfunctional impact on his life that it was previously. Part of the reason for that was that he was really able to start recognizing um, the pattern that was there and the way that his beliefs about himself and the experiences he'd had in his life really predisposed him to have his substance use issues. Um, and just kept maintaining it and kept it going on and on in this recurrent pattern. So once he got on top of that and he could recognize that, John could really start to um, exert some control over that and also have a sense of um, being able to catch it early and notice what was happening. And overall, this had a big impact on his quality of life, um, even though he was still using substances at times. So that's a bit of an example of, of how EMDR might look in this setting. Now, John was seen in a public AOD clinic, in a busy public AOD clinic. Um, as I said, he was seen quite opportunistically because when he was doing well, we would try and do as much treatment as we could. And if things got difficult, we might have to have pauses. Um, there were lots of times where therapy may have been interrupted, but we really just tried to work around that. His sessions were mostly 60 minutes. His first couple of EMDR sessions we did for 90 minutes. Um, at times he'd be seen twice a week when he was doing well. Other times it might just be once a week or once a fortnight, depending on how he was going. But all up, he had about 15 sessions um, over this particular course of treatment. So interestingly, um, on top of the, the research I've already talked about and that kind of one approach maybe we could um, use for EMDR in this setting. There are a few studies underway that are going to really help us flesh out what's happening um, in applying EMDR in this population. And fingers crossed some of these should start to be published soon. But I'm sure all of you are um, probably interested in how we might get trained in EMDR. And I know that's certainly something people are contacting me about quite regularly. So in Australia, um, EMDR training is overseen by the EMDR Association of Australia, EMDRA. Um, and there's a, a, a list of trainers um, who are accredited available on the EMDRA website. And each of these trainers have had um, a process of review conducted on their training to ensure that it meets a standard um, curriculum of what we expect to be included in what we call an EMDR basic training program. So 
our EMDR basic training program is the start point for anyone who wants to learn EMDR. This is 50 hours total, it's normally 20 hours of, of lecture based learning and 20 hours of skills based learning. A large component of EMDR training is actually applying the therapy in workshops and so typically um, large chunks of your workshop will be spent practicing this intervention on each other um, under quite close supervision. So if you intend to do training in EMDR, um, be very aware that, yeah, you'll have some experience of what it's like yourself. And I know for myself, when I first trained in EMDR, I went in as a skeptic. I didn't really believe in it. And then um, I had it applied to me as part of the training and it worked. And so here I am. Um, obviously, that practicum and skills based learning doesn't involve working with um, traumatic material. Um, we work with lower grade aversive memories. So this is things like um, you know, small fender benders, scary moments, um, difficult experiences in our childhood that maybe wouldn't normally be the focus of therapy, things like that. For most training providers, this um, training is split into two workshops. Um, and on top of that, you do also have to complete 10 hours of case consultation. So kind of a supervision process after the training to help support you implementing the intervention. And once you've completed those components, um, then you've completed your EMDR basic training. If anyone is interested in more information, um, the EMDRA website, the EMDR Association of Australia, is a good place to start. As I said, they have um, all the information about training and, and the processes for that. They also have lots of resources, um, including some um, a section of videos and things about EMDR and what it looks like. Um, and some of those are quite good for clients as well. And then the EMDR International Association, which although it um, it's called the International Association. It's actually just the US um, Association. So that's the um, that was the first standalone organization um, that was developed to support EMDR um, outside of Francine's own company. Um, so they've been around the longest and they've got lots of resources as well, but they are US based. It's not actually an international association. So in summary, I guess EMDR therapy is a trauma focused treatment approach and so when we're doing EMDR we are working with difficult memories and experiences that people have been through and we use those experiences to conceptualize their current presenting issues including substance use it does have a good evidence base um, for things like PTSD and depression and it's developing elsewhere um, in the area of addiction, like I said, it is a murkier evidence base. And so we do have to kind of tread a little bit cautiously there. It doesn't mean we can't use it, but it means we have to be clear that um, it maybe isn't always gonna be our frontline approach. What is useful about EMDR though, is that because of the overlap of substance use and addiction issues and trauma related issues, um, EMDR can be particularly um, effective on those comorbidities. And it seems to therefore, um, be a nice um, addition to our tool set um, for comorbidity. Um, and also to yeah, understand those underlying patterns of substance use. So that's it for me. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much, Logan. That was fantastic. Um, we have had quite a lot of questions come through and we do have a bit of time to go through them. If we do not get to your questions, um, Logan has put his email address on screen there. So uh, I think he's happy for us to let you know that you can email him and follow up. <laughs> um, but I will start us off by asking, going through some of these questions that you've asked us. Um, so first of all, Logan, what is your experience using EMDR in clients or among clients who present with psychosis in particularly, or sorry, particularly with drug-induced psychosis? Uh, yeah, so there is um, there's a small evidence base for um, treating comorbid post-traumatic stress symptoms in um, clients with psychosis, and there are some better, larger trials that are going on right now using um, EMDR and other trauma-focused treatments in that population. In general, we have some indicators in the literature that it's safe to use trauma-focused treatments in populations with psychosis. Um, I have done it as well, and and my only advice with that is is if someone's in a a, um, a substance induced psychosis that's quite acute, um, I typically wouldn't 
engage in something like EMDR until that had resolved. However, in clients with more chronic um, psychosis where um, maybe they live most days with experiences of um, delusions or hallucinations, um, as long as that's relatively stable and they understand the treatment, um, then I've, I've used it in those populations with reasonable effects and no issues. So again, it just comes back to that issue of if it's very acute psychosis, um, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to be jumping into a trauma-focused treatment immediately. And I think that actually there's another question that when I was reading through these, and there have been a lot, so I've been trying to keep up with them, um, it did remind me uh, I guess I wanted to ask you as well, uh, are you able to conduct EMDR among people who have, I guess, cognitive impairment? Yeah, um, again, the um, in the Netherlands, there's some studies going on specifically looking at this at clients with um, intellectual disabilities of different levels, but also um, other conditions like that. Um, so the main thing with this would be that it would depend on the client's particular um intellectual disability um, cognitive impairment so for instance when we're working with clients with an acquired brain injury um, I've had clients who, who can't do visual tracking um, and and we found that EMDR wasn't very effective I've had other clients where it's been absolutely perfect so it will depend a lot on their cognitive profile um, but my advice in that area is always to get advice around what kind of cognitive impairment they have and then just be really clear that they have capacity to understand what treatment we're engaging in and the rationale for it um and then gently stepping in to see what sort of effect we get hmm. I, I might just jump in as well related to that answer you gave is a couple of the questions we're asking about um how how it works with clients perhaps who aren't able to visualize uh, a picture for many reasons i guess but including um a fantasia yeah well. So when we talk about getting a client to bring up an image of the trauma, um, that's really just a, um, an approach we use to activate the memory. So if I ask a client to close their eyes and think of, um, of that memory and think of the worst moment of that memory, most clients will have a picture pop up spontaneously. Um, however, if they don't, it doesn't mean that we can't use EMDR. It would purely just mean that we want to make sure that the memory is activated. It's in their mind. They're thinking of it and experiencing it. So, for instance, I've worked with clients who've had... Um, motor vehicle accidents or assaults where they don't have a clear um, visual representation of what happened. And for some of those clients, they generate one that may not be accurate because they were unconscious. So they mm. have an idea in their mind of what happened and that's kind of what they picture. And then for other clients, their experience of EMDR is not related to visual imagery and it's instead um, emotions, thoughts, body sensations coming up during processing that they experience instead. So yeah, it can still certainly be used. Got you. Thanks, Logan. Mm. Um, another question's come through asking about your thoughts around the evidence for using EMDR for treating pain, in particular the work of Mark Grant. Yeah, I think um, this is another great example of where um, EMDR often um, runs ahead clinically before the research. And so it's been used to treat chronic pain for a long time because of the overlap often of, of chronic pain um, mm. and mm. adversity and trauma. And so Mark Grant has developed protocols and approaches to using that and some smartphone apps that um, are used very, very heavily in the um, EMDR community. There are some trials that have looked at this that have actually gotten pretty good um, results and good effect sizes. But again, it's that same old story of perhaps they're not as um, large trials as we need. There may be some methodological issues. And so... Um, I'm aware there are some bigger trials going on now that will hopefully give us more clarity, but it's a little bit like substance use where we've got these kind of positive indicators, but the evidence has some issues. Yeah. Sorry, just looking through the list of questions is growing as we speak. <laughs> and I'm sorry, everybody, that we probably won't get through um, all of these. I will Quite just a few say of them with, are around um, different comorbidities, aren't they? Yes, that's true. Yeah. 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 I'll just quickly say about training. I see there's a few questions about yeah. training. Um, People can go to the MDRAW website and I might even just pop the little link in. Um, there are eligibility criteria to train in EMDR. Um, and alongside that, there's also a, um, 
a process by which um, if someone maybe doesn't meet all of the eligibility criteria, but do meet most of them, mm -hmm. they can apply to train under what we call exceptional circumstances, where they can kind of put a case forward and say, look, I don't meet this criteria, but I meet all of these other ones. Can I do the training? So there are minimum requirements of qualifications and things, um, but those are all listed on that link I just posted in the chat. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just going back up to the top of the questions here. Um, when you want you you talk through quite a like a really detailed case example, and there is a question here about how long it took for the history taking and the treatment planning for that example. Mm. Um, I think with that client, it was probably two to three sessions, but mm -hmm. I think in most cases it's a bit of an evolving process. Yeah. Um, and part of this is about the more EMDR you do, the more effective you get in considering clients um, in that way. So. I think you can become more and more efficient at how you conceptualize those clients in that way. But when I first started this, this took me, you know, session after session after session of trying to work out what was going on and where do we start and are we ready to start and all of that. So um, that's where the good supervision comes in as well. And um, also I'm wondering as an issue that's across uh, trauma related therapies um, of many kinds is it? that question around stabilization and what sort of level of stability does a person need to have in, in your opinion and experience before commencing mm. EMDR? Yeah, I think when I first started, you know, I was seeing clients for 12 months plus before I'd start trauma focused work. And that was sort of how I was originally trained in, in therapy. And then, mm. um, but nowadays I'll often start EMDR with people in session three or four. Um, so it does vary based on the client. Um, and the worst bit is there's no hard and fast rules. But in general, what we want to see is that um, as a therapist, someone would have a really clear understanding of what's going on for a client. Mm -hmm. They understand the symptoms and the experiences. The client's able to tolerate distress enough to sit in a session and, and work on the material and think of it. And that the client's practically able to attend. So if a client... Um, doesn't have a fixed residence that's okay as long as they can come and see me every day and they've got somewhere that is safe enough to go to after a session um, similarly if a client's using substances that's okay as long as they're not going to come into a session grossly intoxicated and unable to participate for a client who's um, heavily dependent on a substance that they use every single day and have done for 20 years it is probably a better option for them to stay on the substance rather than to try and come in abstinent one day and enter some sort of withdrawal process. So um, it is very much based on each individual client and there's a variety of factors there. Mm. Also sounds as you're talking that through that a lot of that has come with so much of your experience as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I used to work on the rule that, you know, we want to try and get them to be um, not using a substance for 24 hours before or after a session. Um, and I tried that for a while and that is somewhat like herding cats. So um, I, I just didn't kind of stick to that hard and fast rule and instead I base it on the client and how mm -hmm. they're going. And I've had experiences then where clients um, maybe haven't gotten as big an effect from EMDR if, if they've used lots of substances after a session. Um, but that's kind of our worst case there is that it's probably not going to work. Mm. Or there's a, a smaller amount of improvement than they might have. Exactly. They yeah. weren't, but there's still... Uh, there's still something, thing. right? And they still have a positive mm -hmm. treatment experience, which I think is very important. Okay, there's uh, quite a few questions that we haven't got to, but um, we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to wrap up and uh, actually, Logan, if it's all right with you, I might send the questions that are remaining here to you and yeah. perhaps we can post answers to those on our website. So and then if there's anything else that people just put you on the spot there so <laughs> that I've cornered you. <laughs> no I'm happy to, to receive yes. emails. Good. Okay. And um, anything else, please feel free to get in touch with Logan to follow up. So just um, as we're wrapping up, just wanted to uh, briefly mention our comorbidity guidelines and our resources, which this webinar series has been based. If you wanted to look up any more detail about those, you can at our website there. And what's wrong with my presentation here? Okay, you can also download a copy of the guidelines as a PDF. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us for this webinar. Um, as I mentioned, if you're interested in doing this recording or having a look at our library of past webinars, you can do that at the website that's on the screen there. Thank you again. And thank you so much, Logan. Um, it's been a real pleasure to hear from you and your expertise today. And everybody else, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Logan.